Welcome everyone. I'm Elizabeth Abrams, Provost of Merrill College, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the annual Noel Q. King Memorial Lecture. Tonight's subject is Voices of God, Voices of Madness. As most of you here know, Professor Noel Q. King helped introduce the study of religion to UC Santa Cruz and helped engage Merrill College students in lifelong curiosity about and respect for the beliefs of peoples of the world. Professor King's characteristic inquiry when greeting someone new to him was, tell me about your people. This afternoon, this evening, we'll be hearing just what he would have liked to have heard, a story fundamentally about people, about what and how they believe. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few technical details about the platform we're using tonight. We're using a webinar tool, which is essentially a one-way lecture format. So unlike a regular Zoom meeting, there is no chat function, but you are welcome to ask questions as they come to you through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the formal presentation, Professor Lorman will address as many of those questions as she can. Tonight's event will also be recorded and posted within the next day or two on the UCSC Arts and Lectures website and also on the Merrill College website. Um, I'd like to introduce our sponsors and of course our participants this evening. Um, we are very fortunate to have been sponsored uh, by uh, one of Noel King's former students, uh, Dennis Diesner and his wife, Barbara Diesner. Um, Dennis graduated from Oaks College in 1977. The UC Santa Cruz Humanities Institute is also a sponsor uh, of this evening's event. Um, and of course, the King family, Lori King, Zoe Quinton, and Nathan King. Lori R. King will serve as interlocutor and moderator at, uh, at, uh, at the end of Professor Luhrmann's presentation. You may know her already. She's the best-selling author of many marvelous books, including the Mary Russell Sherlock Holmes series, which weaves religious studies and history, women's studies, and a host of other topics into the world of detection. Ms. King, too, is the winner of many storied awards, including nationally, the Agatha, Creasy, McCavity, and Lambda Writing Awards, and locally, the Gail Rich Award for the Arts and Santa Cruz Artist of the Year Award. She is proudly the only author, I should say the only author yet, uh, to hold both an Edgar Award and an honorary doctorate in theology. Our speaker, Tanya Luhrmann is the Watkins University professor in the Stanford Anthropology Department. Her work as an ethnographer and experimentalist has taken her all over the country and the world to listen to and speak with Christians, Zoroastrians, practitioners of magic and others. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has been a Guggenheim fellow and has written opinion pieces frequently for the New York Times. Her books have won prizes made it into the Times notable books, and most recently been the subject of a feature length article in the New Yorker. Professor Lorman, thank you so much for agreeing to present the 2021 Noel Q. King Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me do the magic of sharing my slide. Okay, and does the slide look the way the slide should look? All right, so I'm honored to give the Noel King lecture. The more I know about him, the more interesting and compelling he sounds. I've utterly enjoyed my encounter with Laurie King and her work. And to honor them, I want tonight to talk this afternoon about a human experience at the heart of religion, which is the voice. So the voice, um, I'm used, gonna use that word to mean an experience of communication with another that's who is not materially present. And that sense of an other who is speaking in the absence of the body is at the heart of faith. It's also at the heart of madness. And because of this, I think it teaches us something fundamental about the, the nature of the human experience of thought. Let me begin by trying by making the argument that voices matter. They matter because they're evidence of spirit. 
spirits speak. That's how you know that they're there. So Enkidu spoke to Gilgamesh, Yahweh spoke to Abraham, Jesus spoke to his disciples after his death, the angel Gabriel spoke to Muhammad. In any account of prophecy and in most origin tales, there's a voice. Voices have mattered in history. A voice converted Augustine. He desperately wanted to become a Christian. He described himself as torn against himself. And one afternoon, overwhelmed by emotion, he, he ran into the garden, threw himself at the foot of a fig tree, and he heard a voice that enabled him to convert. And he changed the history of Christianity as a result. Voices enabled a peasant girl to persuade the King of France to give her an army, which arguably ultimately saved the kingdom. More recently, when Martin Luther King sat at his kitchen table in the winter of 1956 at the, at the, on the eve of the Montgomery bus boycott, he was terrified by the fear of what might happen to him because he'd gotten death threats against, against his family. But he sat at his kitchen table and he prayed and he heard the voice of God promising, I will always be with you. And he went forward. Voices matter to more ordinary humans as well. This next woman is actually a, um, a, a Santa Cruz graduate. And when she left Santa Cruz, first job she got was um, the morning shift at 7-Eleven and it did not make her happy. One morning this woman came in and she looked like she'd been up all night. She looked like it had been rough. She threw her stuff on the counter, two six packs of Miller Lite, some cat food and a food product of some sort, donuts, I think. And she looked at me and she said, hey, can you get me a carton of cigarettes? And I'm thinking, excellent. This is what I wanna be doing with my life. So I turned around, I rolled my eyes and I started thinking my judgmental thoughts. In that moment, I literally heard the voice of God say to me, do not judge this woman. I have created her in my image and I love her. And poor woman, I almost fell over. I'm trying to give her change and I'm like, whoa, the voice of God spoke to me. I have been changed ever since. This next woman is somebody I met in Chicago where the winters are different. It was pretty early on in my relationship with God. I just had wonderful devotions and worships and I just felt so close. I went out and it was the most God awful day. It was icy rain and gray and cold and it was sleeting, but then he just graced me the rest of the morning. The bus showed up right away, which it never does. I was reading and I missed my stop to get off and I heard God say, get off the bus. I looked up and I hollered and, and the bus actually stopped. I just felt that intimacy all morning. Like when you go from holding a new boyfriend's hand to kissing him goodnight. So in this case, the voice was audible. And mostly tonight I'll be talking about these audible or quasi audible experiences when people ha have an experience and it has kind of a hearing quality to, for them. And one of the things I wanna to say to begin with is that some of these experiences, sometimes God says, I, will, I love you. I'll always be with you. And sometimes he says, slow down, get off the bus. Sometimes they're, these are important voices, sometimes a little less so. But the key point is that the voices, the words stand out as if they're not spoken by the person who hears them, that they, they don't feel like the thinker's thoughts. They feel as if they come from outside. How common are these experiences? Well, if you show up with a clipboard, you ask a bunch of questions, maybe about in the middle of other questions about mental health, you get a rate of about 5%. When I talk to charismatic evangelical Christians, to people who want to have a back and forth relationship with God, about a third of the people I talk to say that at some point, God has spoken in a way they could hear with their ears in a quality with a, with a kind of a a hearing quality to the experience of the communication. When it comes to bereavement, the experience is even more common. So when somebody has lost somebody they love, and most of the studies are done with spouses, the rates are like 70, 80, even 90% of people will who say that in the months after the loss, 
they have heard or seen or felt the presence of the person that they've lost. So these experiences aren't uncommon, but they don't happen to everyone. Why? One explanation is that God doesn't talk to everybody. And I'm gonna bracket that both because my skill is in addressing the human side of the human God relationship, but also because I believe that if God is speaking, God speaks more often than people hear. And I think that this is something, the, the, the question of why that happens is something to which the anthropologist uh, can contribute. Perhaps the most obvious explanation, the most natural explanation is that people are mad, that there's sort of a continuum of psychosis. Then by psychosis, I mean people who have markedly distorted thoughts and markedly distorted perceptions. And you know, up at one end of the continuum are the people that we think of as flagrantly ill. And Augustine and Martin Luther King Jr. are kind of at the other end of the continuum. And I think there is a continuum of psychosis and people are distributed along that continuum. Um, but let me, let me give you a feel of the experience of psychosis. And this is somebody that I met in San Mateo. There's a young man. He said that when he was driving, he would hear voices from the other cars. When he stood on the pavement and a car drove by him, noise would slough off the car's trunk like water and resolve into voices like a bubbling stream of jeering, laughing words. When the room was noisy, individual sounds would, would break off and form themselves into voices. When the room was quiet, he heard less, but a muffle, muffled echo in the, it, it, and the muffled echo would become a man in the other room. When he moved his leg, his leg would speak to him. When his stomach grumbled, it became an angry reprimand. The voices were like the aftertrace of color images as if when he waved his hands to the, to the air, it left language in his wake. Horrifying language, words that sneered and drawled. He knew that these voices were symptoms of an illness, but they sounded real to him and he couldn't dismiss the possibility that they were people. So I again, I think there is a continuum of psychosis, but I wanna suggest that there's another story to tell as well that there are differences in the way that people relate to thought. And that has something to help us understand why some people hear, hear religious voices and other people do not. So who am I to kind of make these observations? I'm an anthropologist who studies human relationships with invisible others. My first book was about people who call themselves magicians and witches and druids in London. And they sought a relationship with spirits who kind of represented the aliveness of, of, of the world, of the earth. They sought to experience Caradun and to hear Caradun respond. I went to what was then Bombay and Tried to, and tried to understand a, a, a group of people, Zoroastrians, who were, cre who were creating a, a mystical Zoroastrianism, trying to revive this, this ancient faith. More recently, uh, I, I wrote, spent time with people who you would call charismatic evangelical Christians, Christians uh, who really wanted to feel God's presence immediately, intimately, as if he is a person among people. And I've spent time with people in churches like that, in Chennai, in South India, and in Accra, in Ghana, in West Africa. I also got myself initiated into an Anglo-Cuban Santeria group, a group that practiced spirit possession spent a year in a, in a, in a church in a, with a kind of emphasis on, on black Catholics, uh, spent another year in, in, in a shul with newly Orthodox Jews, uh, joined for a short period of time, a California cult. And I've become the kind of person that people write to and say, 
I have these experiences. You should interview me. And then, and then I do. I've also spent a lot of time with people who experience psychosis. So I've spent well over a thousand hours, um, many, many months on, uh, on the streets of Chicago in a neighborhood in Chicago that arguably has the highest density of persons with psychosis in the entire state of Illinois outside of the jails. Spent time with persons with psychosis in Chennai, in South India, in Accra, in Ghana. And so I wanna begin by asking, what have I learned? What do I see about the experience of voices of madness and voices of spirits? I wanna begin by, by saying that I see something very different. So I've spent many, many hours talking to hundreds of people about their experience of voices. And what I see is that the people who carry a diagnosis, most usually a diagnosis of schizophrenia are most difficult of the psychotic disorders. People who, are, who have psychosis, when they talk about their experience, they talk about an experience, they talk about frequent, frequent voices as if they, they're kind of living within a, within a beehive of people yelling at them, talking to them, commenting on them, talking to each other. They can, this can happen throughout the day. It can be continuous. What they hear is many, many words, extended sentences. They can hear sentences, paragraphs, conversations, people constantly saying new things about their experience. And the content of those experiences is often pretty negative. Not always, but often. People will hear, you smell, you're disgusting. You, you should die. You should have jumped. You should jump in front of that bus. You should die. Terrible things. That's not what I hear from Christians with, with psychosis, without, without psychosis and with other people who don't carry a psychiatric diagnosis. When they describe these voices that have a hearing quality, they're rare. So people can remember one, maybe two, maybe, maybe a handful, but they're not all the time. What they hear is brief, four to six words. Rarely, if somebody's reporting more than that, they're probably having a different kind of experience. And what they hear is startling, but it's not negative. So somebody will be, you know, a woman told me that, you know, she, she told me she's, she's, she's driving down the road and she hears God speak up from the back seat of the car saying, I love you. And, you know, it's very startling. She's heard a voice. She pulls over to the side of the car, the side of the road, but then she weeps because it's so amazing. These experiences also just feel different. So, and by that, they're phenomenologically different. There's, there's something in the different quality of the way that they're felt. So the woman that um, I, I was pictured with, um, she said to me that, I'll be watching TV and I'll be doing my artwork and I'll hear stuff. It's almost like they're using the physical properties of heat, light, and sound, and they bounce something off here, like a signal. It's not the way that Christians talk. Here's somebody who said, I, I was at the grocery store and it wasn't like this audible, but I felt like God did a hiccup or something. Somebody with psychosis said to me, the voices, it's like a hostile takeover of my mind. And Christian said, well, that, that voice, it, it certainly wasn't unwelcome. It's not a sense of taking over. What I also noticed about these experiences is that they can be developed. These religious, religious experiences of voices, having the sense of communication. So when somebody goes to a church like this, and I spent a number of years in, 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 in churches like this, um, they often arrive in this, this charismatic evangelical church and let's say, you know, God doesn't talk to me. I, I know he talks to you. Would, would you ask him something for me? but he doesn't talk to me. And 
I saw that people would learn to experience God communicating to them. So the first thing they had to learn is the mind isn't private. That thoughts and images and sensations that you might have understood as generated by you, your own thoughts, are actually God speaking to you. So people have to learn what I came to call a new theory of mind. The experiences you might have taken to be internal can actually be the words of somebody outside of yourself speaking into you. This is what it feels like. This is a young woman who explained to me, well, when people are were praying over me and I'm just receiving it, and all of a sudden I hear, go to Kansas, which is where her parents uh, lived at the time. Because I was debating whether to go to Kansas, but I hadn't been thinking about it within a 24 hour period. It makes you wanna say, where did that come from? And so what people at the church where I was spending time would say, was that, or what I could see that they did, that they began to you know, pay attention to that kind of stream of consciousness and to pick out thoughts according to a kind of pattern of discernment. They'd look for thoughts that were spontaneous, that popped into their mind. They'd look for thoughts that were the kinds of things that God would say. God never tells you to jump off a bridge, a pastor explained to me. They looked for, for thoughts that were sort of in accord with a kind of thing that they read about in the Bible. And so they would, they, would, they would learn how to kind of select certain thoughts. And then what I could see over time is that they would feel more and more confident that those were the thoughts that came from God and that God spoke to them. So they would start out not knowing how to recognize God's voice. And then a few months in, they would say things like, I recognize God's voice the, the way I recognize my mom's voice on the phone. Now, these voice hearing experiences are typically not audible. People don't expect God to speak out loud to them in their minds. There are many, many books that, 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 that teach you how to experience God's voice. And, though, and the books like Dialogue with God, um, they, they'll tell you that God's voice normally th sounds like a flow of spontaneous thoughts rather than an audible voice. And nevertheless, I could, I could see that people who learned how to do this were also a little bit more likely to say that they'd, they'd had one of those odd sensory and quasi-sensory experiences of a voice talking back. I could also see that these were associated with practice. And I, I came to talk about practice as inner sense cultivation. And this was a kind of prayer that and by inner sense cultivation, I mean that people were using the imagination to experience what is invisible. And it's a kind of cultivation because people are really trying to experience vividly that which they have to imagine because it is invisible. And so, I would talk to, to Christians who would, you know, they would be praying and they'd be talking to God. They'd be sort of trying to talk to God in their mind and they'd be trying to figure out what God was saying in return. And they'd be experiencing themselves as sitting on God's lap or sitting on a park bench and with God's arm around their shoulders or standing in the throne room and feeling the heat of God's, po of God's power against their cheeks. And they were trying to use all their senses to experience God's presence as vividly as they possibly could. This is a, this is a long, there's a long tradition of this kind of inner sense cultivation, this mental imagery cultivation in the Christian tradition. The most famous example would be the Ignatian spiritual exercises where Ignatius wanted you to step into the scriptures and experience them as, as, as if you were there. You can also find these practices in shamanism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Islam. And one of the things I saw is that as I talked to people in, the, in this church, 
um, I could see that people who, who prayed in this way, trying to experience God in their mind, trying to use all of their inner senses, they would report over time that they had sharper mental images. Somebody said to me, you know, it's sometimes like PowerPoint sometimes. It's that clear in my mind. <laughs> people would say that the thing that ha they had to imagine, God, angels, would feel more real to them. And they reported that they had more of these funny voices and visions, these sort of sensory, quasi-sensory experiences of the presence of an invisible other. So I ran an experiment. I, I got a hundred people into my office, one after the other. We talked to them for a couple of hours. We gave them a set of surveys. We sat them in front of a computer screen and did a set of exercises to see how they use their mental imagery. And on their way out, they had to pick a brown envelope that had an iPod. And there were different kinds of iPods. One of them was loaded with, um, and they couldn't decide they would should have to they would choose they would sort of they were randomly assigned to to which ipod they got one of them had these ignatian spiritual style exercises where they were kind of invited to experience the scripture with all their inner senses and then invited to have a back and forth conversation in their minds with the uh, with god the other ipods were loaded with lectures on the gospels excellent lectures and the rule was half an hour a day for, for six days a week for four weeks. We brought them back in, we interviewed them, we uh, gave them more exercises, we had them fill out more surveys. And those in the prayer condition were more likely to report sharper mental images, more sense of God's presence, more sense of God as a person, and more voices and visions. So I want to suggest that there is something like a non-mad pathway, that there's something that in which attention to inner mental events leads to those events seeming to be more external and more in the world real. And that and there's something that suggests that these voices, these religious voices, have their origin and thoughts. They might have their ultimate origin someplace someplace else. But the human dimension is that they have the, their origin in thoughts that come to be experienced vividly, intensively, and that they, as, as if they're not me, not inside, as if, they, as if they pop into the world and feel as if they're coming from someplace else. So now I want to um, offer some more evidence for these um, for a non-mad pathway to the experience of voices, I wanna talk about two other factors. An orientation, a person's individual sort of personality style, their orientation to ex an experiential immersion and a cultural model that the mind is open, porous to the world. And I find that there's a relationship with this trait and this model of the mind with these vivid sensory-like religious experiences. So for a number of years, I've been, I was running something that we call the Mind and Spirit Project, which uh, was a Templeton funded large project in which we talked to people around the world. So the, the field workers that are, and the postdoctoral fellows are down the side and we've got a Santa Cruz guy in there, Josh Brahinsky. And, um, so we met together as a team and we talked and we talked and we talked. And we decided that we were going to look at the way people thought about their minds and the way in which they experienced spirit in different locations. We sent people to the field workers, the postdoctoral fellows, went off to the United States, to Ghana, to Thailand, to China and to Vanuatu and in those different places. They did the people did these these, these rich, multi-hour interviews with deeply religious people. They did four, short face-to-face -face interviews with members of the general population. They gave surveys to undergraduates. We spent time in Christian churches, but also in the you know other local faiths. Did a ton of work. Did many and. and and we found that two factors, 
you know, robustly predicted voices, vision, the sense of spiritual presence, and other spiritual experiences. So let me tell you a little bit about these factors. One of them is absorption. So there's an absorption scale, 34 items. You give it to somebody and they read the sentence, the statements, and they say, this is true or false for me. So sometimes I feel and experience things the way I did as a child. I can, I can be greatly moved by eloquent or poetic language. Sometimes I can change noise into music by the way that I listen to it. One of the things that I had seen in my work in the United States is that again and again and again, the more truths people wrote marked on that paper, the more likely they were to say that they'd experienced voices or visions, but also the more vivid God was for them, the more God felt like a person, the more they felt like a con they had a conversation with God. I think this scale picks up something that it picks up your ability to be caught up in your imagination. And I think it blurs the boundary between the mind and the world. It allows what must be imagined to feel more real. And maybe even the practice, the inner sense cultivation of prayer practice is a kind of way of training the absorption, allowing you to experience the inner world more vividly. The other factor I wanna describe, I'm gonna describe through what I'll call the anthropology of mind by which I mean an exploration of the different ways that people think about thought in different cultures. And what I wanna do is to point out, you can, you can ask a lot of questions about thought-like stuff. And I wanna invite you to observe that you often have conflicting intuitions about how you experience your thought and that different cultures invite you to think about those those thoughts in different ways. So for example, where is thought located? Where's the mind located? Most of the time in many, many parts of the world, most of the time, if you're secular, you think about your mind as located in your body and when your body goes, your mind goes. But you know, if you're religious, if you have the glimmering of the idea of a soul, you have some kind of commitment to the idea that the mind can survive outside the body. Is the mind private? Are your thoughts, you know, just yours? We often have the deep sense that what we think other people can't know, but you might have had the passing thought that maybe somebody could read your mind. Many of us in our culture, we have the idea that twins can read each other's minds when it matters. And if you're religious, and if your religion is monotheistic, you probably have the intuition that God can read your thoughts, particularly when they're the kinds of thoughts that are not quite moral thoughts, and God will know. So do you own your thoughts? That's almost a basic, almost a definition of thought that it feels like me, it's, it's a mind, there's a minus in my thought. William James, well, that's one of the first things that William James said about thought, that thought has a quality of minus. But, you know, we also talk about anger sweeping over us. We, we don't know where it came from. We talk about inspiration as if the inspiration came from outside. We talk about ideas popping into our minds. Again, if you're religious, you might think that a spirit could put a thought in your mind, and you might believe that you could be cursed by somebody else, that somehow their thought that curse could enter you. And there's causation. So the idea that your thought can go out of your mind and act independently in the world without your action. So most of us, most of the time, we think that our thoughts stay within us, but you might have the intuition that you don't want to sleep in a bed in which somebody has been murdered, or maybe that anger lingers in a room after a fight, or you might have a twinge of guilt if you got really angry at somebody and then it happened that they got hurt. When somebody's facing difficulty, we often say our thoughts are with you, even if we don't play or don't, we don't pray. This, this is sort of the domain of magic and witchcraft, which in the, at the core of magic and witchcraft 
is this idea that intention can act upon the world directly. You might use special words. You might place the intention in a talisman. You might, you know, you might have to have a wand, but the intention really matters. Okay, so this is how I'm defining porosity. The idea that there's a permeable boundary between, between the mind and the world, and that somehow thought can cross into the world or somebody's thought can cross into your mind, independent of action. And I want to remind you that these are ideas, these are beliefs, not experiences. These are beliefs about how the mind works. And this is what we found in the Mind and Spirit Project, that no matter where we went, no matter how we asked the question, the more absorption somebody said yes to, the more voices they reported, the more other spiritual experiences they reported, the more porosity statements they agreed to, the more they seemed to believe in the power of thought to leave the mind, the more spiritual experiences they reported. So you had these kind of beliefs and they were connected to experiences. And so here's the paper that came out recently that presents these data, came out in a very cool place. And the point I want to make here is that the, this, this, this all suggests there's a story here that the experience of voices is not necessarily due to madness, but something about the way that we deal with our thought itself. And I want to suggest that there's some story here about the way that you judge your thoughts and your judgment changes the event. Not all the time, not, but just enough. So at some times, for some people, there's some experience that seems to pop into the world. So I think that there are a couple of different judgments that really make a difference. One is that if the thought, if the thoughts have more sensory detail, it increases the chance that somebody judges the thought as if it's caused from something from the outside. If the thought feels spontaneous, you're more likely to judge it as not being you, but having some other source. And if the thought feels more powerful, you're more likely to judge it as coming from the outside. And all of these judgments are facilitated by cultural ideas that thoughts can move back and forth between the bound, across the boundary between the mind and the world. And they're facilitated by a personal tendency towards an experiential immersion or absorption, which probably blurs the mind-world mind boundary. So let me just give you a tiny a very blunt sense of the way that judgment changes experience. And I'm going to share with you a little snippet that I've used in my own work. And this is sort of a musical snippet and people it often sounds like birds chirping. So now, hopefully you heard the birds. Uh, now I want to tell you that actually... That's the first line of the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And now I want you to hear that in the same snippet. And once you hear it that way, it's really hard to go back to hear the birds. So now I want to switch tacks. And I want to ask, might this general process of thought judgment suggest that psychosis might also respond to learning, to the way people learn to judge their experience. And what I'm going to do is talk about a study that I did um, around psychotic voices in three different countries. Um, I and my colleagues, and here is that study, um, came out in the British Journal of Psychiatry. So what we did was we talked to 20 people in San Mateo 20 people in Chennai, 20 people in Accra. All of them diagnosed with schizophrenia, their worst psychotic illness. Um, so they're all ill. They're all recruited through, through, through hospitals. Everybody thinks that they're ill. And we tried to be really careful about how we did the interviews. 
so that we weren't sort of biased in our in our judgments. So my Tamil colleagues did interview their 20 people, mostly in Tamil. And then I came in and interviewed a chunk of them in English and interviewed another group of folks um, in English because English is a language of instruction. And when I did the interviews in, in, in Accra, I did them with um, a Ghanaian research assistant. And then I left and I sent her in so she could interview a whole another set of people so we could see whether people would say the same thing to her when I wasn't present. And so we asked them a bunch of questions, um, but I really wanna talk about two things now. I wanna talk about, or I'll talk about a couple of things, but I wanna talk about the, um, how unpleasant the experience, the experience of hearing voices was. And I wanna talk about the question of whether people knew who was speaking. And um, I wanna begin by saying that this is not a romantic story. I am not saying that if you have schizophrenia and you are outside of the United States, life, life is wonderful. Everyone is struggling, everyone is hospitalized, but people have a different experience of hearing psychotic voices. The Americans, all the Americans thought that hearing a voice was a sign that you were crazy that there was something that was terribly wrong with you. They were very comfortable with diagnostic terms. This wasn't true in Chennai and Accra. In America, strikingly compared to Chennai and Accra, the voices are violent. Here's a man who said, usually it's like torturing people to take their eye out with a fork, to cut somebody's head and drink their blood, really nasty stuff. In America, in this sample, among 20 people, not one American told me that their dominant, one of their dominant voices was positive. All of them were negative. Chennai. Over half the sample, not everybody for sure, but it, more, over half the sample hear their kin. They know their kin. They know their mother. They met their father. They know these people. They just also hear their disembodied voices. And often those voices are telling them to go to the kitchen, to clean, to cook, to dress, to do domestic, to, to do these sort of domestic chores. They also talk to them about sex. So if the negative voices that the Americans hear are violent, in Chennai, more social, more place where people have a more inter interdependent sense of self and where people have much more at stake in thinking about where the sexual behavior, particularly of women, is terribly, terribly important to the honor of the family. The voices talked about sex and they shamed people in public. So, 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 so a man would get onto a bus, a man who hears voices and he would experience his voice, no one else could hear this, but he would experience his voices say to the bus, you're masturbating. They all know that you're masturbating in Accra, a much more intensely religious place, half the sample heard God, and they were very clear that God was the dominant or the only voice that they heard. They knew that they had a problem, uh, but, what they, but they would often say that it was because of God that they were able to deal with a problem. That's what helped them to manage being in the hospital. And both in Chennai and in Accra, the voice was more of a relationship. And this, this happened repeat again and again. Whereas the Americans, they hear this harsh assaulting experience of voices. The, in general, on average, for many people in Accra and Chennai, people experience the voices a little bit more like a relationship. And so you have this phenomenon that the US stands out in these, in these three groups. Their voices are more alien, more violent, and less relational. So I want to suggest, as we come to an end, that there are different pathways to these experiences. And both for psychotic and for non-psychotic experiences, practice and culture seem to shape the experience. Why do we care? 
I want to observe that it's really tempting to imagine the mind like this, as a vast, immaterial, internal universe. In our American culture, this is bounded. It's all ours, and it's bounded off from the world. Nobody else can get in, or thoughts don't get out. That's probably not how the mind evolved. We were, or the mind very likely evolved to help us interpret each other, to figure out each other's intentions. It's a more peopled mind. I think that we probably experience the mind in relationship with other people. Probably a child probably comes to the awareness, my mind, from in relationship to the awareness of my mother's mind, intentions, desires that are different from mine, that are not me. Many of us are aware of our own minds as we are aware of others' minds, as we are aware of, their, of, of the other person's thoughts, intentions, desires. And yet in America, we have this model of this infinite, immaterial, bounded, bounded world, really, really important and all ours, lonely and set apart. Why does this matter? Well, I think one of the things that this work finds out or that my work uh, observes is that Americans compared to other societies often have fewer spiritual experiences. It's more difficult for them to experience God and spirit intimately and vividly because it's so weird to experience others in the mind. It's your own universe. It's kind of like, it's kind of odd to have a spirit pop in. And so people arguably experience spirit a little bit. Well, our work finds that people have fewer spiritual experiences. There's another important observation, which is that Americans and other Westerners become more distressed when they're psychotic. So this is a very robust observation from a series of, 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 of projects um, from the World Health Organization, a series of studies in which we, they, the researchers find that if you look at somebody typically in, in the US or the UK, those are the dominant Western sites, and you compare them to somebody in the so-called developing world, and there are a number of sites, the best, the best data come from India, but many of the researchers in the domain think that this applies more broadly than, than India. You look at somebody when they fall ill, and then you look with psychosis, so they're hearing voices, and you look at them two years later, outside of the Western setting, they're more likely to be off medication, not experiencing symptoms, able to work, able to function. And again, they've done this work in a number of different studies, in a number of different ways, and there's something quite resilient. And again, I'm tempted to think that there's something about the intrusion of others into the mind that's just terribly upsetting to Americans and may make their experience more tough. I mean, there's more going on than, than just the experience of voices, but I think the model of mind may make things a little bit worse. And finally, above all, the story of voices is, is, is about the question of how we hold others in our minds. So anxiety is the experience of agitating voices in your own mind. If there are ways of kind of reining in the experience of harassing voices, we ought to explore that. If there are ways of enhancing a good inner voice, we ought to explore that. And it's possible that imagining the mind as vast, interior, and bounded makes that a little bit more difficult. Thank you very much. Now, I am, I am here, and I am here to take questions. Um, are, 
is the audience seeing me or am I just a disembodied voice? I'm not sure which. Oh, anyway, if, if somebody- We can, can see you, Lori. Okay, okay. Hi, I am Lori King. Um, I am I am the spokesman for uh, for Noel King here, and I and I have to say he would have adored this. Um, he he would have he would have taken you off, and the two of you would have been talking about this until midnight, and um, and he would have just just adored it. Um, Noel was one of those people for whom um, the the voices were a regular part of his his daily life. Um, I doubt that he would have said he actually heard them um, in his ears, but certainly yeah. his, his, his experience of God is a daily thing. It's, I mean, it's interesting that there's, there's sort of these two, two kinds of voices that people have. One is an ecstatic reaction. That is the mm -hmm. voice of God as a, as a revelatory thing, as um, a, a, a voice from the heavens that changes your life. There's, uh, you know, like St. Paul. And, and for other people, it is a daily life. It is part of daily life. And, you know, Noel would occasionally um, sit down and people would assume he was asleep. And occasionally he was asleep, but um, he, he would also sometimes just be praying. And that was part of, part of his daily life. Um, which, as you say, is not a Western approach to the voices in your head. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. And when you are able to have a, this kind of powerful sense of sort of an intimate other who speaks in powerful and helpful ways, then it's, it can be it can be helpful for people. Do you think that um, that this power to change has? more to do with your state of mind when the voice is heard um, than, than the power of the voice itself. I mean, if... Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I think that, um, I mean, if somebody hears an instruction that is helpful, that is that they take to be not themselves, they, will take, they might take it more seriously then um, and they might take their own advice to themselves. What I saw in these churches is that these experiences of um, these spiritual experiences and these prayers would enable people to experience God as a person and more or less as a person, as a person, as, as a being with very person-like qualities. And I thought that that relationship worked like other emotional relationships with persons and that that was what changed people. So that in some sense, a, a powerful experience with a God is a little bit like a marriage. It is, you know, somebody gets to know God, God feels different, God feels autonomous, uh, God feels like somebody that they're interacting with and they, change themselves in relationship to God, just as the God as a person-like being shifts in relationship to the, to, to the way that they grow and change over time. Does that help? I mean, so I, I think that many of these most, most many of the most profound um, experiences of change that I saw in church settings came from the relationship with, with spirit. Rather than, rather than a one-off moment of what the Spirit said. Although it is also true that people have these remarkable experiences that just stop, stop them in their tracks. I loved the, the article. And for those of you in the audience, I highly recommend that you take a look at Dr. Lorman's website because she has a number of articles there that you can print off. There's one that was in, uh, in Harper's uh, in 2018. Uh, and you talk about a woman named Sarah, who uh, who just has these voices in her head in their daily life, and she just has learned to accept them. And she goes on, and they she sees the dead um, because she works in a in a hospital. And she, I, I mean, it's just it's just her life. And you yeah. sort of think for some for some people the you know this idea of a threshold 
the, the, the a liminal experience from the, the, yes. the, the words means threshold. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, they live a lot closer to the out of doors than most of us do. And, and for it's, it's so delightful to think it's possible for someone who clearly is diagnosable. I, I mean, anyone hearing voices that consistently and that thoroughly and seeing things, um, most, most psychiatrists would agree that she should be under treatment, but she's obviously doing just fine. And I love the idea that in some situations, people can. Yeah. I mean, this, this is where the idea of the continuum of, of psychosis is important because there are people who, I think it's really important to hold on to the fact that there are probably people who are just going to be really, really ill. But I thought that what I saw, and I, I didn't talk about this work, but I've, I've recently been trying to find more Sarahs, people who have very frequent voice hearing experiences who look like they could meet criteria for schizophrenia, except they're doing fine. And so I've been looking at two groups of people. One of them are um, mediums. So mediums, you know, sort of more popular in the, the UK than in the US, but these are people who talk to the dead and they will, you know, they'll show up on a, on a stage platform or you might book an appointment to the medium if you want to talk to somebody who's died or you might go to a spiritualist church and you'll see such a person and, you know, they'll stand in front of the room and they'll say, they kind of, they'll, they'll kind of behave differently and then they'll, they'll sort of throw their tick back or something. And then they say, okay, I'm getting a woman in her 50s. She's very elegant. She's uh, she died unexpectedly. Is that does that mean anything to any of you? And then like four hands go up, and then the medium adds a few more details, and then we we settle on one hand, and it's and they find out whose spirit it is, and then they talk about that spirit. So I've been talking to a bunch of mediums, and a lot of them are people like the Christians I met in my evangelical churches have a lot of interior experiences and every so often they have an experience that pops out. Some of them, small handful, but some of them, more than one, um, they, when they talk about their voices, they say they have a lot of audible experiences multiple times a day, that they hear negative scritchy voices as well as good voices, that, um, they have learned that when that they decided to become a medium because they were already hearing voices. And, you know, and then they talk about what it meant to become a medium. And they talk about all the learning they did, all the ways that they spent time identifying those voices. And it looks like they, for some small number of people, they're able to kind of grab hold of what might be a psychotic experience and transform it. Another group I've, I've spent some time with, there are a group of folks in, in Ghana who are called a Kung Fu. And so these are people who um, you practice the traditional religion and there are many gods and they have shrines and they go to the shrine and they talk to the gods and the gods talk back. And they might, you know, if the clients come and, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll, you know, they might talk, the, the clients want something from the god and they and the Kung Fu will talk to the God for them. And the gods often talk to them outside of the shrine. And again, so my, I, so my team first was interviewing like 40 people like this. Most of them kind of like the Christians in the church. They have interior experiences um, and occasionally they have an exterior experience. Some of them, they were hearing voices from a young age the, some of those voices that they still hear are negative. Um, the, uh, and they, they, they say, and they talk about how important it was to get training. And a couple of them told a story about, oh, you know, my aunt came to the house and she told my mother, it's, my mom should take me to the hospital, but instead my mom took me for training. And at the training, my, my, my master, he told me not to pay attention to the bad voices. And he told me how to listen to the good voices. And they do that for two years and they're functioning quite effectively. So 
it's hard to prove that that person has changed their voice hearing experience. That's why I dwelt so much on you know, trying to demonstrate that there's a change that can, that can happen. Mm-hmm. It's hard to prove that that's a person who would have been more ill had they not been trying to transform their voices. But I think it's really, I think that's what's going on. That some people who are vulnerable to really developing serious psychosis are able to manage their experience a little differently and sort of turn it around. Mm-hmm. Um, we have quite a few questions here, most of which we won't get to, um, but I, I, there were a few of them that I, that I thought would be good. Um, one of the questions was, is one gender in the various cultures, one gender more likely than another to experience voices? Great question. Um, uh, and we haven't really looked at that. Um, in I can say two things, that, that, which is that on average, women are a little bit more likely to, or they score a little bit higher in absorption than men. And women secularize more slowly. Um, but, we, but we haven't done, we haven't actually looked at the, the means for different kinds of experiences more, but I, I would bet that it might be a little bit more common for women. Sure thing. Um, one, one question of, that, that came up um, that I found interesting because of my background is, can you speak about the prophets such as Jonah whose experiences of voices was compelling but not exactly welcome? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, well, my favorite prophets here are Samuel, John of Patmos, and Ezekiel. And I think they are having different. So I who knows what the Bible's describing. But the narrators of the Bible are describing different kinds of phenomena. So the narrator who writes about Samuel, and you remember that Samuel is um, he's a kid. And he goes off to you know, live with a priest. And uh, he's trying to fall asleep. And he hears a voice saying, Samuel. And he gets out of bed and he wakes up the priest. And uh, Eli, maybe. And um, the priest says, go back to bed. I wasn't calling you. And it happens again. And then it happens again. And the priest finally says, this is God. Listen. And, what, and that is a certain pattern of voice hearing. So people are a little bit more likely to have these experiences on the edge of sleep. Um, and Samuel had the, had the pattern of rare and brief, rare, brief, startling, but not negative. So he, um, he has these, you know, short ch- segments in which he, he, there's an event, it feels like it's not him. And then I'm willing to say that the narrator sort of describe when God goes off and talks about a paragraph of, of information, that's really the narrator adding stuff. But there's Samuel. John of Patmos is like, he's in some kind of trancey dream. So John of Patmos, first of all, he's having, you know, so the author of Revelations. So he is, um, he's clearly having audible experiences because he hears a voice and he turns to look to, to see you speaking. But he has one we- hallucination-like experience after another. He is somebody who's in this um, more trancey state, way at the end of the absorption scale. Somebody who's really getting caught up in his, in, in his inner world, I think. And it's outside of him. It feels real. And Ezekiel is clearly presented in the, in, in the Bible as a vehicle for God. And, and I want to be very clear that, you know, anyone can be a vehicle for God. Any of these prophets can be a vehicle. for They are presented as vehicles for God. But the biblical narrator is presenting Ezekiel, in my view, a psychotic. He has a lot of experiences. Many of his voices are negative. They're very weird. They insist that he eat a scroll at one point. It, 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 they're just strange. He hears his voice. He, he hears people talking, uh, invisible beings talking to each other. He doesn't want to follow the, the voice's instructions. They're full of commands. There are lots of commands. So I think, anyway, I th- so I do think that the biblical portrayals of the prophets 
betray different kinds of experiences, different pathways, if you will. Um, they show that a God could use all of those pathways. And they suggest that, um, you know, it's a complicated story between the, the, the experience and the, the, the human's willingness to respond to the experience and use the experience. Which again goes back to the, the idea of your state of mind when you, when you, when you have the voices of, uh, is this ground fertile for it or is it, um, is it just, are you too busy and the ground is too hard and it bounces right off? Which I imagine that <clears throat> most people who have a voice come in and they're in the middle of something, it just sort of, it doesn't even register. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that that's why Americans have fewer of these experiences. They don't. Um, one of the comments, one of the, it's not, it's among the questions, but it's a comment um, is from one of Noel's students. Um, when assessing special ed students experiencing <clears throat> auditory hallucinations, his first question was if the voices are friendly or hostile. And if friendly, they at worst were distractions. And if hostile, I would train the students to hum, particularly a happy tune, which transported the hostile voices, uh, transplanted the hostile voices, and they found relief by doing this so that if you can, if you can drown out, drown them out some way, especially with something that is positive and other sensory. Um, yes. Yeah. Which which is kind of like a sort of self medication um, that that psychotics and that the schizophrenics often do. I mean, they're, they're self medicating on various substances. But if you if you can do it with a happy song, <laughs> all the better. <laughs> so people who hear psychotic voices sometimes say that if they actually if they sing it changes it if they if they play music it drowns out the voices some people for some people i know a woman much to the distress of her housemates she felt that reciting the psalms kept the voices at bay <laughs> so to, to do this most effectively she would recite the psalms at you know full pitch i know up and down the hallways and it drove people nuts, but it really helped her. Um, there's a very cool um, new kind of radical intervention called hearing voices groups. And what they do is they, they, they teach people to, people, people with psychosis, they teach people with psychosis to um, treat their voices as persons. So they're kind of sort of like the, the kind of the mediums, the Kung Fu, um, they teach people to name their voices, to respect their voices, and then to talk with their voices. And again, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, and it seems sort of radically opposed to the American approach of kind of only treating psychosis with medication. And I have to say, I think that medication is often useful. But this behavioral approach, I think, is quite interesting. And there's some evidence that suggests that it works for some people. I did some research in um, the, the period of the late 19th century and how the mad were treated in Britain. Yeah. And it was really interesting because we tend to think of the Victorian era where you would just lock people away in an asylum and lock mm -hmm. and shackle them to the walls as being particularly cruel. But in fact, in some ways, it was, it, it opened a lot of doors to the talking cure to um, giving them a, giving them warmth and ritual and everyday life and tasks to do mm -hmm. that as soon as the psychiatric world started turning to interventions, whether they were the first um, sort of brutal, um, therapies or later on tweaking with drugs uh, mm -hmm. sort of got left behind and you sort of think there are a, a lot of a lot of people who can function quite well if everyone just accepts that they're they're mad so i mean i think that's also part of the story that people who they think that these experiences are very very weird they worry that they're crazy and that you know, and, and that may make things more difficult for people. 
uh, that may, may, may certainly makes it more difficult to come to terms with themselves, but actually might make the voices themselves meaner because people hate them so much. You could, you could see how it would. Um, a question was, and there were a couple questions that sort of overlapped with this. Um, who was more open to listening to other points of view, those who were considered psychotic or those who have heard God's voice without getting too political, <laughs> talking about <laughs> that's you know, and the politics of the last few years. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I, it's, um, um, you know, I think the challenge of psychosis when somebody's really ill is that it's the, the by the time they're in the hospital, the or they're struggling with their their experience. Um, that piece of their experience is um, I don't know. I had many many good conversations with both kinds of people, um, and I think that. I think that humans are cognitively very flexible and there's certain domains of their identity or the way they are in the world. And so some people who are, um, some people can be very committed to a certain point of view and be very flexible and open about talking about other things. Um, Psychosis, I think, is a difficult condition. So it's hard to have a conversation and just change somebody's experience of psychosis. Um, but people can be more or less open and talking in all kinds of ways. It, it's a very good question. Yes, yes, you sort of wonder at, at what point do we get locked into our own point of view and Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One question about uh, actual possession. Um, yes. If you've worked with individuals who are said to be experiencing possession, um, mm -hmm. which is which is sort of the extreme of hearing voices, I would guess. So I have uh, the those are the so the Akomfu in Ghana are all people who will become possessed, and the. Um, and among the mediums, many mediums will become possessed. Whether it's exactly the same thing in different settings is a little wobblier. But in general, um, I would class the capacity to go into a trance-like state in which you feel like your identity is not yours. I would talk about that as um, in the same domain as dissociation, trance, and absorption. So I think of absorption as a broad capacity and association, maybe hypnosis and trance as more intense versions of that capacity to get caught up. I think that um, people who are in that domain have a little bit more control over their experience. So with the Akomfu who I thought were psychotic, so it's not so uncommon for somebody who is psychotic to also be able to dissociate. And so there are so many things we don't know about the relationship of psychosis and dissociation and so many debates. And some people think that all psychosis is dissociation and some people think that's a terrible claim. I myself think that people who are able to dissociate and who are psychotic, who, who also have psychosis, are probably more able to manage their voices. They probably have more control over their experience. Um, I also think that people who become spirit possessed, that there's a kind of, there are different kinds of spirit possession. There's some people who are kind of performing more than other people. And some people, you know, so there, there's a, the two things I would say from talking to my Santeria folks and my Kung Fu. The first is that when a possession first happens, it's much more dramatic than when it happens 10 years on. So people, when they first get possessed, they're often amnestic. 
the spirit enters them. They pay very, very weirdly. People think that there's something really wrong with them. They know it's a spirit, but there's something really wrong. And the person wakes up and can't remember a darn thing. And I think that that's not performing. I think that's true. And that's much less like likely to be the case 10 years on. It is also true that within that pool of people who have these experiences, it's, it, there are different kinds of intensities. So there's some people who really get very, very, very into trance. And they are, they, you know, they, they, when they go into trance, they black out more. They're more out of it. And there are people who go into much lighter trances. And that probably has something, probably has something to do with training. And it probably also has something to do with individual proclivity. Um, um, is, it, is it the same thing as the speaking in tongues churches in the... So that is a related phenomenon. So tongue, tongues are fascinating. So tongues, um, so if you, a pastor once, for those of you in the audience who don't know, tongues is a series of phonemes that you recognize from your own language that feel like a language. So, so a pastor once said to me, if you say she should have bought a Hyundai and you say it fast and repeatedly, you will send as if you're talking, speaking in tongues. She should have bought a Hyundai. She should have bought a Hyundai. She should have bought a Hyundai. So that's, okay, that's, that's tongues. There are, and we're actually doing some research on this, but there, there are different ways of speaking in tongues. One way of speaking in tongues is you go to a church, the pastor says, pray, and everybody speaks in tongues. That's performing. You know how to do it. It's still a gift so that people who have the gift will feel that their tongue takes over. So they feel, you know, people feel that they decide to go into to speak in tongues, but they feel like their tongue is in charge. There's another way of speaking in tongues. So this was really striking in um, Accra when, when people, people loved speaking in tongues. So I mean, many of the Americans I knew loved speaking in tongues, but it was like, like this much of the service and this much of their practice, whereas in Accra, it's like just a lot. And people would, you know, and when people get into the tongues and it feels really, really good, they also say that they feel light, they feel good, they feel like they're floating, and they feel like this will cure their cold. It feels like something that sweeps through them and it just feels good. So not all possession feels like that, but it's the same domain of human capacity. You're so somehow the person, and it's the same domain of capacity as hearing voices as well, I think. So you're somehow giving up that sense that you, uh, that you are in your mind, in charge of the world, in charge of yourself. And said so somehow something happens where this Human phenomenon, maybe, you know, you can have different theology, theologies. Is there a spirit behind the human phenomenon? But there's some human phenomenon at which this, um, what some people would call the executive function, goes. And the, what must be imagined, feels veridically real. And that's, you know, it happens in tongues, it happens in spirit possession, it happens in voices. So, so here's an easy question. Yeah. Does your work suggest to you that God is a being who is outside and separate from us? Oh, you know, um, everybody wants to <laughs> answer to that question. And <laughs> I really like this uh, verse in the Bible. It says that when you know, Jesus says, when two or three of you are gathered, I, I will be among you. And you can interpret that to mean when two or three of you are gathered, that third or fourth person, that's me. I'm standing over there. I'm the supernatural person right there. And, you know, it's a, out there. You could also interpret that first to say, well, that's the name of a good community in which we're gathered together. And I like to have that flexibility. And I just don't think that, um, anyway, I don't have an answer to that question. I, 
I, I figured you probably would have thought about it. <laughs> um, one of Noel's longtime friends uh, from the church down here, um, Janet, writes that um, the words that she's heard have been within her head when she's asleep or just barely awake or in prayer. And they've always been positive or instructional. And her life has been saved because of sending me to hospital or helping with diagnosis. And all of the voices have been from God, except that when my husband died, he not being much of a believer, it said, I am free, which I, I yeah. think is lovely. It is really lovely. Yeah. It's, um, it is really lovely. And one of the things that is um, very robust, you know, one of the things that these studies have found again and again and again is that um, is the presence of the departed. And, and again, you can have a pretty broad range of understanding of what that is. It is pretty clear from the research that um, some people, if they have these experiences of the departed spouse, um, are able to sort of work with those experiences so that the relationship still feels intact. So that, that was kind of the start, the first of these studies was done with Welsh widows and widows and widowers. And 70% um, had had some sensory experience of the departed spouse. And a good number of them said that they, you know, not that they, you know, not that they thought about remarrying but, and they were too, they're through with all that. They said, this is sufficient for me this relationship continues. Um, I, I, there are various, there are various other questions here. I think we could be here all night. Um, one of them, let me just, let me just do one or two more and then we can just have a, a little talk that I kind of mm -hmm. were shooting at the end at half past. Um, Noel's other students, who's a pastor, asks if someone who is schizophrenic may find it easier to cope with life in the East than in the West. I think so. I actually think there are a number of reasons why um, schizophrenia in this country is so darn difficult. One of them is that maybe as many, certainly over a quarter, maybe as many as half of the people who end up with that diagnosis are homeless for some period of time. Not rocket science to observe that homelessness is terrible for somebody with schizophrenia. Um, many people in this country, um, you know, we have this model of, you know, independent persons. And, you know, so after the, after early adulthood, someone with schizophrenia in this country is often alone. Like in India, they're, they're staying with their family. That may not be so comfortable with their family, but it's probably much better for the person. In India, when people, um, when a doctor talks to a patient in a family, they don't do diagnosis talk. I mean, they write the diagnosis on the pad of paper. And we know this, I mean, I had a student who spent a year there. This is my own experience of being, there. so I, my student was in, North India, I was in, uh, was in Chennai and Tamil Nadu. People will write the diagnosis on a piece of paper on their notebook, but they don't do diagnosis talk. I mean, when I was in, um, when I talked to these, these folks in, in, in Chennai, you know, two or three people spontaneously used a diagnostic term. All, all the Americans did. And schizophrenia is such a toxic identity. Um, and their voices are more, more gentle. Um, and so, yeah, no, I think it is better. I, I don't think it's, it's not, it's not a miracle cure. It's not like, you know, uh, it, it's not like it's, it's, it's lovely for somebody in, in India to have schizophrenia. It's just a little bit easier. We think it would be easier in a 
in a place that has a stronger sense of community in general, mm -hmm. community responsibility mm -hmm. rather than they ought to do something about this. Um, yeah. we, we ought to, we have to do something about this because we are, this is family. Yeah. And, you know, and in, in this country, our identity is in our mind, which is kind of great until your mind, you're, until you're told that your mind is broken. So one of the great books about psychiatry, about schizophrenia is called The Broken Brain. Just, I mean, very, very highly capable book. But if you're the person with a broken brain, it's, it's kind of tough. Whereas, you know, in a more interdependent culture you know a sense of self is often more tied up with i'm a member of this family i'm a member of this social world I, again it doesn't mean that it's a solution but it mean, means it's a little bit easier um what what is different about um the, the experiences that are deliberately sought out, whether it's through intensive meditation or through the use of psychedelics to drive yourself to a state of being, whether it's hearing voices or feeling closer to the divine. What's different about the experience that you say? Oh, I mean, what's different about those experiences? how is it different when it is deliberately sought, whether through psych psychedelic drugs or through um, intense focus on? You know, that's a really good question because they, it's, so the big bold difference is um, kind of positive and negative. I mean, it, it, it was sort of complicated here. I should say that this is a whole sort of discussion with a bunch of colleagues about how to think about the differences between psychotic experiences and voice experiences. And that's why I perseverate on this because it's because some scholars in this area wanna say that it's the same experience. It's just that those experiences are a little more negative and a little more uncontrolled. I think that it's, um, the way and people have been struggling to describe psychosis accurately for 100 years, over 100 years. And I am searching for words to think about how to describe the difference in a compelling way. And what I want to say is that the feeling of realness is different. So I think humans have many kinds of realness that, when, that God, even for the most committed uh, believer, uh, God is differently real than a table and a chair. Those are, they, they, they treat God differently in, in a number of ways. Like, like my favorite example for this difference in realness is that Christians will tell you that God can do everything, God can do anything, God is all powerful, and they never ask God to feed the dog. So there's something constrained about the way that they treat God as real. When someone is psychotic, and I say this knowing that it's really hard to put a clear circle around psychosis, there's something much more alien and um, compelling about those experiences. So when God speaks and someone's not psychotic, even if God commands, it doesn't feel commanding. You can get, you can, you can walk away. So like one of my Christians heard God say out, you know, outside her head very clearly start a school. And it was a very important and moving experience for her. And she never did. Many people with psychosis hear these commands all the time. And so it's something deeply interesting in the imperative quality of voices in both settings. There's something really deeply interesting in the commanding quality of these voices. I mean, the voice rarely says the sky is blue. The voice says, <laughs> tells you to do something. But when um, a psychotic voice commands, even if you don't want to do it, it feels more commanding and it's hard to 
justify that claim because who am I to pass judgment? But there, it just, there's this kind of, um, the clinicians, they use this, they use this term that's kind of weird. They, they talk, talk about the smell of psychosis or another term that's in the literature is that precox feeling. That um, comes from a great psychiatrist, um, uh, Emil Kriplin, who talked about, that identified schizophrenia as dementia precox. And there's, some, there's this kind of weirdness feel. And there is, um, when people have these experiences, voices or mystical experience or a vision, and they're not psychotic, it just doesn't feel doesn't when they talk about it they don't talk about it as if it feels weird in the same way like like when people someone i know who was profiled in harper's you know she said she talks about her experience of psychosis as oh this was when i i, I knew that the world was was made of paper and you know and she talks about sitting with her sitting with her therapist and knowing that her therapist was dead while also talking with her. Well, you can, you can identify that double bookkeeping in religion. You know, it's, and people joke, Christians joke about it all the time. Like, you know, I, like I remember a young woman, a, a little girl who was kind of trying to get at her mother, but she wanted to swim without her little noodles and her mother was going nuts because she would swim without her little, you know, those little, little floaty things that, you know, keep you from sinking. And the little girl said to her mom, if I went into the bottom of the pool, God would tell you. And her mother went like nuts because her mother clearly did not believe that this was going to happen. And so, you know, you could do the double bookkeeping in religion as well, but it's like, there's a different um, relationship with the everyday world even when the person is out of their mind in a, like, you know, another person I knew, La Jolla, he goes down to the ocean and he's Jewish. He's, he's, he's on the verge of becoming an Orthodox Jew. He looks out at the, the waves and all of a sudden he knows God. It's white light, the wave speaks to him. He's transported, it's fantastic. He has this kind of, you know, amazing relationship with a sandpiper on the beach. He is utterly and completely transformed and he goes home to dinner. And it's, it's there's something, and anyway, that, that, that's, that is such a hard question because it feels very different. It, I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm a writer. I have lived in publishing for, most of my adult life now. And the one thing that that all publishers, that all readers, that all storytellers are looking for is voice. Mm -hmm. So it's made this last hour and a half fascinating because the idea of voice as being something ineffable that you you know when you see it on a page and you hear it in your ears. Mm -hmm. And yet it's also, um, the voices of God in your head that may or may not be welcome. Um, so I, I think that um, Elizabeth may have a few words to say before we finish, but I wanted to say my own from the family and from Noel's larger family, many of whom were here in the, in the chat, in the Q&A, I saw them. Um, we want to thank you so much. And I, as I said, Noel, Noel would have just adored this. It was really fun. It's been really fun to get to know you. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and for speaking so eloquently about subjects that um, many of us have been thinking about for a long time. Um, and I want to thank everyone in the audience who came and joined us uh, and perhaps heard an echo of Noel King um, in Tanya Lorman's uh, presentation. Um, I want to let you know that a recording of this lecture will be available within the next day or two um, on the UCSC Arts and Lectures website. It'll also be available on the Merrill College website. 
Um, we offer the Noel Q. King lecture annually, uh, usually in April. Um, and because of the disruptions of the recent, um, this past year or so, um, it's been a little itinerant, um, but here we are, uh, delighted to have you here. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, that if you'd like to donate to the lecture fund, um, uh, the Noel Q. King Lecture Fund, you can go to the Merrill College website um, and the link should be in the chat. Uh, and uh, you can make a donation there. Um, we, um, the fund funds the lecture and, um, and you can see what a wonderful uh, result we have from that. Uh, also in the chat um, are uh, links to Lori King's website. Um, her books are listed on that site. To Tanya Lurman's website, uh, her books are listed on that site. And as Lori mentioned, um, you can uh, find some of her articles there too. For more information on the history of Noel King, you can go to the Merrill College website. Um, and um, again, I want to thank you. I appreciate your coming. Thank you. It's been a, it's been great. I've really enjoyed the, the, these, this conversation. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all.